G'day gorgeous! Here inside today, too breezy out, it will just be noisy and distracting and I don't like to be distracted when I'm talking with you, excuse me fiddling here. So the beauty about being inside, literally, is that we get to do rocks. And today, oh, I can't believe how long it's been since this little friend's been with us. This is fluorite, and as many of you will know, um, or as you may know, fluorite comes in different colours and it grows in layers. And this is a little tumbled piece and it's just gorgeous. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Julian. It's gorgeous to see you. Share this little friend with you both. And with everybody else who jumps on in and out of time, welcome to this morning for me and whatever time of day it is for you. So, yeah, I love that little one. It's I have to let you look at it again. I mean, look at that. It's, you know, the stronger lines and then the little fine one in the middle. You can't really see how green it is. It's a, it's a pale green, pale fluorite green. Very fond of that. Good morning, Sanchia. I was like, oh my goodness, yes, you. So here is something else. This is obviously quartz. It's pretty fabulous, actually. Um... I mean, really, what do I need to say except that you can see right through it. Every facet is beautiful and um, perfectly formed. You know, it's one of those perfect crystals. Um, there's a little bit of a dent there. Oh, no. Um, but isn't it wonderful? So I really enjoy this, and it's got these little edges on it. But that's how the crystal grew. This has not been shaped at all. And you can see that in the top face, you know. It's slightly like it's been sandblasted, except in the places where it's like a mirror. So it's fabulous. Very optical, see-through, perfect. Here's the bottom. Obviously it was broken off something, but there it is. Um, and last but not least, more quartz. <sighs> this is quartz too. And you can see it's got a plane that runs through it. Yay, rocks! Oh yeah, it does look like a lolly. You're quite right, Julia. <laughs> the fluoride is exactly like a boiled sweet. I tell you, you could suck on it for a long time, it wouldn't dissolve. So this one, apart from the fact that you can see me upside down in it, and like, you know, it's you know, it does that. Um, it's got yeah, see, it's like a line of stars that run through the thing. Good morning, Linda. The shuttle arrival has changed. Excellent. A control crystal from the... Ha, 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 ha. I wish, bud. <laughs> no, it's just this beautiful quartz globe that I enjoy. So I love the fact that, um, you know, half of it's sort of full of stars. There you are. You can see I finally got the right sort of refracted background. And the other half is quite clear. Um... And, uh, yeah, I need, I need a hand in the way. It's awkward because it catch there you go, it catches the light. And if you don't get the right things behind it and in front of it, well, you can't see what's in it. Shafi, good morning. It's been ages. This is quartz. Um, it's just quartz that's been polished into a ball. So, yeah, long time no see indeed. Um, and it's lovely to see everybody who's jumping on, whether I know who you are or you're not. It's a privilege. Um... And we're inside today with the rocks because it's too breezy out there. And um, I'm late today because I had an amazing meditation and after a pretty disrupted night and I actually slept a little afterwards, which was exactly what I needed. But then I opened my eyes and by the time I had done the journaling, which I absolutely had to do because of what happened, I was like, hmm, I'm going to be late. And you know what? I could be late. That's a great blessing to me. So... One of you asked me a question about anxiety yesterday, um, and without going into too many details, anxiety that is constant and in your face, and you worry about everything, um, and your, your brain is constantly predicting and trying to work out stuff, and you know, that whole thing, um, and I just can't stop it, and I'm starting to realize that the more I worry about the bad things that might happen, the more that actually is going to kind of help them happen to me, and, you know, I'm stuck in this place, I'm stuck in this loop, I'm stuck in this fear, I'm stuck in this, ah! Um, and so I thought, well, you know, what would I say? Um, and there's a lot that you can talk about, about, 
you can focus on the situations and try to find solutions for them and you can be reassuring and you can be kind and all that is good. But it doesn't address the root cause of the problem, which is actually not, believe it or not, it's not the situation, it's not the person, it's not the illness, it's not the financial woes, it's none of those things. She says, thinking, oh my God, really? You're saying this? Yes, because this is how I feel. This is what I have to do with myself when my brain decides to say, everything's bad and you need to be scared. Because that still happens from time to time. You step in a lot more than it does. He said it was just normal for me and I didn't even realise that was what was going on. The problem is not the people and the circumstances and the situations and the challenges. The problem is our reaction to those things. It's how we react. And then how long we keep on reacting. And what I decided I wanted to explain is how that reaction keeps on going. And there's solid science about this, and I love it. Because when there is science, and I've learned a little bit about neuroscience, and your hypervigilance, always waiting for the next shoe to fall, the next brick to drop. How does that work? Because if you understand how it works, then and, and you have some clues about how you might change it, well, then you can actually begin to look for ways to change it, right? And that would be a good thing. So how does this work? And I'm going to give credit to my inspiration, Dr. Joe Dispenza, because I have totally learned this from him. I did not understand this until I learned it from him. He is the source of much of my inspiration and a lot of really good information that I have used working with what he's created to change my life. So what happens when you have a traumatic experience or a repeatedly difficult experience or a series of difficult experiences, something that stress, sets off the stress response and either very powerfully, kaboom, you know, your life has changed and it was awful and you keep going on and on and on about it. Um, and yeah, the mind can freak out because the soul is actually saying, wake up, it's time to have something different go on. Um, but I want to talk about the, the mechanism in the brain, okay? What the soul's doing is it's sort of a different question. I want to talk about how this works. When you get your wake-up call, when the bad shit happens, and that bad shit can start from the minute you're born, right? Whenever it happens, if there is a situation, an experience, whatever, where something happens and you notice that you feel differently inside yourself because of what happened outside. And for me, that could be just as, as simple as, you know, being a small child and somebody telling me off. I would feel bad, right? I feel like a bad person because somebody told me off. So stimulus outside, response inside, right? That's a normal thing. You put your finger on the stove, it's hot, it hurts, you jerk your hand away, and you know next time that that's going to be a bad thing to avoid. So we learn by stimulus and response. The body gives us feedback. That's all good. But if you, when you put your finger on the, on the stove and then you take it off, and then what happens is that for the next week, a parent or somebody yells at you every time you walk into the kitchen and says, no, no, you do that, you're a bad person because you put your finger on the stove. I'm, I'm making this up, right? But it becomes emotionally charged. And you start to associate walking into the kitchen and the, putting your finger on the stove with being a bad person. And because it's repeated and the story gets told to you over and over and over when you're small, this is what exactly happens to all of us in some way or another. And it's no blame to parents because they had it happen to them too because it's just what's going on in the brain. Because uh, the brain is wide open. There's no filters to say, hey, this is bullshit. My parents overreacting. It's just, oh, they must be right. I'm a bad person because I put my finger on the stove and I scared them. And this, they're still having their reaction a week later, right? So you get this thing that you get a stimulus and a response. You feel bad about it. And if you get stuck in that feeling, then the brain... What's happening is, I've got to wind back a bit, and this is challenging to do in 20 minutes, so forgive me, I have to live out, leave out big chunks. You have the experience of putting your finger on the stove and your parent yelling at you because they got scared. The brain perks up, pays attention, and says, oh, something's going on, I feel bad. And at that point when you feel bad, by the way, this works when you feel really good too. Okay, this is how we form memories. We remember stuff better because we feel them. There are neurochemical reasons why that is so. Um, 
When, when that happens, the brain perks up, it pays attention, it takes a snapshot of everything that is in the environment. And I think is it 400 million, billion pieces of information we process every second. We... Uh, we pro- we actually notice at that point. I think point zero zero five percent of it, tiny amount of it, conscious. But the brain picks up everything. It takes a snapshot. It records it literally in the architecture of your brain by making synaptic connections that are based on chemistry and, and frequency to remember that situation because it was painful, hurt my finger, and I got yelled at, and I want to avoid that. I want to avoid that. It did not feel good. And if you're going to a watering hole, you know, and there's a crocodile and it takes your hand off, you need to remember that that watering hole has a resident crocodile and you either want to go to a different watering hole or you're going to be a lot more careful next time. This is an adaptive survival-based response. It's really good, except when we get stuck in it. So this is what happens is, you know, you, you burn your finger, your parent gets mad at you and they're still mad at you the next day and the next day and the next day. And so every time you have the same experience, the same set of synapses goes off, you get the same electrical electrical chemical situation going on in your brain, and that results in a cascade of chemistry in your body that results in you feeling the same way. And then, you know, your parent finally stops yelling at you because they finally get over being scared. But the next time you walk into the kitchen, you still remember that you burnt your finger and your parent yelled at you and you still feel bad. Now, how did that happen? Because you fire the same set of neurological circuits in your brain that represent that memory. You remember the memory and the same chemistry flowed to your body and gave you the same experience. That's just how it works at a neurological and chemical level and yes, in the field as well. We're not talking about that today because it's too much to try and get everything around. So so every time you walk into the kitchen then, the kitchen, five years, ten years, fifteen years later, same kitchen, different kitchen, it's kitchen. Your brain subconsciously would say, hey, this is a place where one, I hurt myself and two, people yell at me for being bad. And most of the time you walk into the kitchen and all that's going on under the the, the covers and you don't notice it and you don't feel it because it's normal, because it's you. But sometimes it goes off and you think, why the hell am I so feeling so bad just walking into this room? Or, or there's a person in the room and you think that you have a problem with the person, but actually it's just walking into the kitchen, which is firing up that old neural network and putting you in that state of fear, and it's actually nothing to do with the person. Or you go somewhere else, and there is something in the the somewhere else that fires up some part of the synaptic connection that memorized what that situation was. There's something that's a bit the same, and the brain by association says, hey, this looks like another alligator. This looks like another crocodile. Shit, I better run away. But meanwhile, you're you're not consciously aware of that, Your brain is looking, 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 looking for alligators, looking for kitchens, looking for hot stoves and looking for yelling people, right? And everywhere you go, it sees things that are a bit like that. It hears them, it feels them. And it's constantly firing this reaction up, this response up, at a biochemical level and you don't even consciously know that it's going on, but that's what goes on. And sometimes you do notice and you think, why am I so scared? And, you know, you go through your life feeling afraid of kitchens and looking out for hot things and, and scary people that yell at you. And the brain puts things together by association. It is a repetition of an ingrained response, exactly. And so the neurological connections and the chemistry get more, the neurological connections get hardwired. The chemistry actually conditions the cells so that they're in your body to expect it. So this is just how you feel. And now your body is just doing hypervigilance for you because if you stop being hypervigilant, the cells are saying, hang on a minute, where is my fix of hypervigilance chemicals? This is actually what happens. And I haven't even talked about the fact that the brain, by now, because it's constantly going, where's the alligator? Where's the crocodile? Where's the angry person? Where's that thing that hurt my finger? Where's a room that looks like that room where I hurt myself? The brain is constantly scanning the environment for things that look like that thing that might have happened 45 years ago. But there's this whole, it's called an associative neural network of memories, clusters of neurons that um, represent 
the architecture of similar things that go together in your brain, and it's all throughout the tap, as Joe says, three-dimensional tapestry of your of your brain, right? It's all stitches in there. And, and your whole environment just sets it off all the time, and you don't know it. But because your brain is constantly looking and listening and feeling and tasting and smelling for all of that dangerous stuff, it, it becomes what's called, it becomes incoherent. All the different compartments in your brain that, you know, the, the, the visual cortex is off looking here and the, the hearing centers are doing their thing and, you know, and the brain is busy making connections and saying, that's dangerous, I've got to run from this, oh, I've got to freeze from that, I've got to fight this. And, and, and it's like, you know, it ends up being like, a, a, I don't know, a herd of cats and some of them are fighting and some of them are running and some of them are clawing out the windows and some of them are, are asleep. And, you know, there's no communication and connection and organization in your brain and it feels awful it's a state of incoherence and the brain is working very quickly because it's going from this to this to this to this to this and it's, you know it's constantly and then there's the stress hormones and it just all fires up and is really ugly that's just what happens that's how it works so that is how anxiety and worry works and it's because we get stuck in this constant Hypervigilance, as you said, Linda, um, we keep looking. We're looking for the thing that may have happened 40 years ago, and it doesn't matter what the experience was. And, and this is why things keep repeating, by the way, because we look for what's familiar, and we create more of what's familiar, and it can be debilitating. Hell yeah. Because the brain gets more and more and more and more hooked into this awful state. So how do you stop it before I run out of time? How do you change it? So your brain... And I, I talked about brain waves yesterday, I think, or the day before. Your brain is in high beta. It's at like 40 to 50 cycles a second. Very uncomfortable when all the compartments of the brain are at sixes and sevens, like a bunch of percussionists all just banging their drums. It's a cacophony. Nobody's talking to each other, you know? No conversation. It's like a war inside your head. And if you experience this, you know what this feels like. It's horrible. This is because the brain is literally, it's like a lightning storm. No communication. And it makes for, it's just static going to the rest of your body through your, neuro, neuro, uh, through your nervous system. The body is getting chaos as well, which is why, you know, long-term stress makes us sick. I mean, that's science. It's, it's not, you know, it's not even affirmations. It's just a, a biochemical fact. The long-term exposure to the hormones of stress pushes the genetic buttons for disease. End of story. So we have to break this. How? You've got to slow your brain down. And I've talked about that quite a lot because I'm big into it. In fact, I think we did it yesterday. I talked about opening your focus. Now, what, what is the deal with opening your focus? Well, I've talked about this before too, but I love this story. And this guy back in the 80s, I think, he was trying to work out how to change the brain waves because, you know, there's all this new science coming along with um, measuring brains. And, oh, my God, the brain's actually a thing that's in action. You can measure it. It makes electrical signals. And, you know, it's magnetic and very complicated and amazing what they can do now. Um, and, but they, they knew about beta and they knew about alpha. Don't know if they knew about theta and, and delta. You know, they worked it out. But he wanted to change his brain waves, and he spent 13 days hooked up to a biofeedback device so he could know if he was being successful, doing every kind of thing under the sun. He chanted, he did nose breathing, he, you know, he did everything. And he just couldn't do it because he was focused, he was trying. And when you're focused on something and when you're trying, you're in beta. Because beta is about being conscious and interacting with the outside world and having experiences about it. And your brain in beta is trying to make sense of what's outside you and what's inside you and put it together and make a coherent picture of it so you at least understand it. That's what beta is about. So if you're making a mental effort to nose breathe and, you know, it doesn't work because you're still thinking about it. After 13 days, he said, can't be done. Stuff it. Gave up. Let go. And as soon as he did that, his brain went into alpha. And he's like, oh. And that was kind of the beginning of a whole lot of stuff. It's like, oh my God, you can change your brainwaves. Now, what we know now is that Buddhists have been doing an open focus meditation for thousands of years. And it turns out when you measure the brain, and you can take it, and this can happen very quickly, by the way. It's easier when you've learned how to do it, but there are some people who sit down and do their first open focus meditation and, you know, they can be in a deep shit when they start and 40, 50 minutes later it can be gone. 
It does happen sometimes very quickly. More often, there's incremental change. It just depends on the person and what other training they've had. Um, but what happens when you open your focus is you're taking your attention off the things that you're worrying about. You're taking your attention off the stuff that scares you. You're taking your attention off the situation, the people and the problems and everything else, and you're putting it into the space around you. And this sounds totally nuts, but it's been measured so many times. You know, you have a strip chart with 20 little lines along it showing the different compartments of the brain. And the person has started and they're in a state and it's all, you know, like this. And they do this meditation. And after a while, first of all, the, you know, the ugliness sort of calms down. And then all of the little waves, the peaks and the troughs and the crests, you know, they all start to go up and down together. And that's called coherence. That's when the brain, the left side, start to talk to the right side and the front's talking to the back and different communities of neurons are starting to fire together instead of at sixes and sevens. And when literally, and I've experienced this so many times myself now, literally when the brain becomes more coherent and, and the different parts of the brain start to dance together and play together and work together and communicate instead of fighting with each other, you just feel better oh my god do you feel better um you feel whole because your brain is whole and i've had the experience you know joe talks about this i've seen him you know i, I watched it on a lecture you know you get the left side and the right side it's like whoom whoom and they just the, the two sides unify and then there's this amazing wholeness and i felt this it's amazing it's incredible it's like, oh my god it's bliss it really is just like the most soft, open, peace, calmness, expansiveness, love. I don't know. I can't describe it. it. Right inside my head. And everything else is gone. I'm not aware of anything except just I feel whole. This is That's the reward. That's why it's worth learning to do this. And you know, I haven't really talked about the how because we don't have time. I'm out of time. But I wanted to say that these are some of the facts. There's, more, there's much more to understand. But in 20 minutes, I've done quite well. These are some of the facts of how it actually works inside your head when you're stuck in that, st in that state. And you can learn, you can train yourself to get your attention off, off all of that stuff that you're constantly obsessing and worrying about. And your body will fight you because it wants its, scare, it wants its fear chemistry and your brain doesn't know how to do it and it's work. But it gets easier and it is so worth the effort. Oh my God. Speaking of someone, you know, I only had mild anxiety. But oh my God, without it? Yeah. I notice the difference. And when my brain racks up and wants to see me climbing up the walls, I know what to do. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much for joining in. I would love to know if you have questions. Even if you know somebody who's struggling with it and you think, oh, well, they, you know, this happens and what would you say about that? I don't necessarily have an answer, but I'll give it a shot. So I'd love to know if you've got questions. Thank you for joining with me. Big love. Until tomorrow. Bye-bye.